I was born in 1937. I'm ancient. <coughs> in my grandfather's house in the old Baghdad quarter of Abu Sifin, predominantly Jewish, you entered the house through a heavy studded door down a steep step into an endless corridor leading to a central courtyard with a small garden, a bakcha, with living quarters on two levels with a flat roof where we slept in the summer, and a sardab, a cellar, cool for summer siestas. My grandfather, Sasson, was a cloth merchant operating from home with a team of itinerant peddlers, men and women, who carried rolls of cloth around the suburbs of Baghdad and beyond, the women with access to domestic interiors. So it must have been beyond Baghdad because I remember one of the men was called, was nicknamed Abu Rail, the father of railway. So presumably he traveled around in by train. They would return to the house in the late afternoon and settle accounts and stock. After business, they would party with Baba Sesson presiding, sometimes with Arak and Mezza, with banter in choice Baghdadi Jewish vocabulary. A digression here on drink and drinking cultures. Arak was an important element of Jewish life. I should say that uh, the Iraqi Arak uh, was uh, flavored with mastic gum Arabic, not the um, now common uh, aniseed. I thought that was peculiar to Iraq, but I've since uh, discovered that, in fact, this was quite common in many parts of the Ottoman Empire and Greece, that it was mistake and not aniseed. And aniseed came later. And indeed, in Iraq, when aniseed came in, it was called Zahlawi, after the, uh, after the Lebanese city of Zahla. Um, at one point, uh, 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 yeah, it was drinking, Arak was an important element in Jewish life, both in terms of production and commerce and socializing. At one point, my father, though not a drinker, was part of a cooperative for domestic distillation of Arak. Commercial factory-made Arak, which came onto the market, was not trusted. The drink was an important element of all celebrations, and for some, an item of customary domestic consumption, typically drink tables set in the evening and on holidays with a mezza repertoire in which a particular item, bakalli, was uh, the favorite and continues to be with many old Iraqi Jews or Iraqis generally. Bakalli is dried fava beans, which is now in the Arab world is known as fool. Um, and bakalli is the bakalla, the old Arabic name. And it's only in Iraq and Iran and Turkey that it is known by that name. Um, it, the bakalli was boiled and dressed in lemon and botnaj, another peculiar element. Botnaj being dried penny royal, a pungent mint. Um, in later years, whiskey replaced arak as the favored drink of the middle classes. And like all other Middle Easterners, it was Johnny, Johnny Walker Black Label. <laughs> At that time, my father, Daoud, worked on the railways, first as a telegraphist, then as a station master. This was prestige work dependent on literacy in English, as the railways were still under British management. He was an alliance product, proud of his languages, French, English, Hebrew, Arabic. He was assigned to various provincial stations. I was shown a photo of myself as a child being carried by a Bedouin on a camel that was in Beled, north of Baghdad. His last posting before he left the railways for business was at Baghdad West. 
I have pleasant childhood memories of trains and engines and traveling on them with the privilege of senior staff. Uh, and indeed, the whole uh, culture of railways and images of railways was a very important element in the Iraqi popular culture, as shown by many songs uh, with, uh, which, in which the railways are an important. Perhaps the best known is the Moslawi song, Dan al Abun al Qatar, Curse the Father, Curse the Father of the Train, because it took my beloved away from me. <laughs> Um, so a bad memory, however, was one of my earliest recollections, the night of the Farhud in 1941, and I'm not sure whether it is an actual memory as I was only three years old, or was it something that was told to me afterwards. When my father was at work at the station and we were cowering at the old house with my maternal uncle, a gallant young man, also called Sesson, patrolling the roof, clutching a handgun. The attacks did not reach us, but there was great worry about my father's whereabouts and much relief when he appeared at dawn in his white railway uniform with glittering buttons. When I was four or five, my parents and my mother's family moved house to the new suburb, as it was then, of Bab Shargi now a downtown commercial area. It was a newly built house, but still in the oriental style of central courtyard Ahosh, with a second story and a flat roof, and a kitchen yard, Hosh al Matbakh, with a tenor in one corner. That area was called Orphalia, after the family name of the original owners of the estate, Ottoman notables hailing from Orfa. Members of that family, landowners, lawyers, and judges still lived in the area, and some were known to us. One of my school friends was Qahtan al-Urfali. Shara Abi Nuas, the Tigris Corniche, was at the end of our street. The house opposite was inhabited by the Kuwaiti brothers, the famous musicians, and their family, and we were on friendly, neighborly terms with the ladies of the house. The Kuwaiti brothers had a cabaret, a Melha, Melha Abu Nuwas, at the end of the street, and we children attended the Saturday matinees for free. I remember singing the refrain of Umm al Abaya with the lively, charming singer, and the comedy sketch of one comedian called Jafar Agha Laqlaqzada, <laughs> Laqlaqzada being the son of the stork which I later learned was a kind of Persian comedy act called Akhbari. My father was proud of his acquaintance with Salima Pasha, Salima Murad, and she was engaged to perform at my sister Samia's wedding in the early 1960s. So much of Baghdad life revolved around gahwas, cafes, but only for men, and Jews were no exception both as cafe owners and as patrons. Earlier in the century, cafes were the main avenues for musical and other entertainment, and Jews were prominent in those fields. But then this function was largely taken over by cabarets and so-called casinos. They continued, the cafes continued as venues on rendezvous for various social categories, neighborhoods, political and intellectual groups and occupational and business circles. At examination times for schools in the summer, many cafes allocated separate rooms for studying and revising students, opening into the early hours. In our neighborhoods, Batawin, Sa'dun, Abu Nawaz, Jews were prominent as patrons. My father and his associates frequented a particular cafe in Batawin for sociability and for business. He and his partners were, in the 1950s and thereafter, contractors, kontarchi. That's an interesting word because it's a composite word from the English contract and the Turkish uh, chi ending. Uh, 
they were engaged in public works of road building and other constructions for the municipality and the government. And indeed, one at one point under the Qasim regime with the building of Medina Thora, uh, which subsequently became Medina Saddam and subsequently Medina Sadr, as it is now, they were part of the contractors who uh, were engaged in that work. They had teams of engineers and subcontractors, and on particular evenings, they would meet at the cafe to settle accounts and plan work. The men were drawn from the various communities and faiths of Iraq, from his Shiite partner originating from the south and living in the Sedda area, the, uh, the shanty town for southern immigrants, but he had there, he, he had built a proper house, which he called the Ghasr, uh, a palace. Um, so the Shiite partner originating from the south to the Baghdadi labor contractors and drivers to the Armenian engineers. I was sometimes present both at sociability and business and learned to play Tauli, backgammon, which made me feel manly. <laughs> men, mainly single young men, like one of my uncles, would also frequent cabarets and bars. When it came to public eating, the predominant form of public food at that time, like in most Middle Eastern cities, were the market food stalls and cook shops, specializing in particular items, most commonly the kebabchis, but also stall, stalls serving bowls of pacha, tribe, um, which is very common and popular in Iraq and considered by some as a national dish. And kubba, was otherwise known as kibbe, stews and pastries. There was even an, a, a renowned cashier kubba stall. Clients could eat standing or crouching, sometimes on stools, but merchants would also send, send out for takeaways. Some of these uh, successful stalls became restaurants with more diverse menus. Other restaurants in the Western style were becoming established, some in upscale upscale hotels, other in the more salubrious bars with a mezza repertoire. And most typical and local of all was Samak Mezguf, the barbecued fish, outfits on the banks of the Tigris, serving uh, clientele on makeshift tables and chairs or in Corniche cafes. My family and their milieu considered restaurants inferior to home cooking and would only go to them for socializing and going out, not for food, and would only order non-meat items, avoiding non-cashier. The exception was the Samak Mazgouf, not a home dish and enjoyed by all with the atmospherics of the river in season. It's still considered a national dish of Iraq. Now, while talking about the river, Linda mentioned swimming. This was a very important element, at least in my time, in Jewish uh, social life for the kids. Uh, that it was a highly ritual, at that time it was highly ritualized. You had um, special compounds, uh, makeshift compounds built from wood and uh, uh, things like that, uh, which were called chardar. Um, chardar is Funny, it's a compound word from jahar, uh, dar. Jahar is four and in Persian, and dar is mountain, four mountains. And uh, so chardar, uh, you'd go there early in the morning before the heat of the day, uh, and it was highly organized with uh, professional tutors who taught uh, swimming. Uh, and uh, where you graduated through a number of what was called kahrab. Uh, I, I, I haven't got the tr translation in my head, but it's uh, something that makes you float, which comes from the palm tree. And uh, karab, karab, that's right. And the karab, so you graduated, you started with four karab, and as you learned, you then had uh, uh, three and two, and then 
you, you discarded them entirely and you became a swimmer. You graduated, as it were. And the way you went uh, was you went on a medda. Medda meant that you walked uh, upstream and then you started swimming across to the other side, that was Sob. Uh, and then you came back, and the current would then bring you back to the Chardal uh, from which you started. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were chants that you would uh, chant, you know, the teacher would start the chant, and all the followers would uh, echo it. And I see, tell this ch chant because it has a story. One of the chants was, Yaulad Belbul, Beli, Meshustam Asfur, Beli, in Gorbotasa, Beli, etc. It's related by uh, the wonderful Khaled al uh, that uh, in the uh, Berlin Olympics in 1940s, when there was an Iraqi delegation there, and uh, uh, every team had the chant their national anthem or whatever as they passed, they passed through. And the Iraqi team were stuck and they didn't, <laughs> didn't know what to say. And so their leader said to them, Yawlad Balbul, Bali. This is Khaled al So I, I, I don't know about the accuracy, but it's, uh, if it isn't true, it ought to be. Now, cinema. This was our major source of entertainment, pleasure, and fantasy, imagining the world outside. There were several cinemas uh, within easy distance from our home. A pattern was established of a visit to the cinema every Saturday morning with friends. Cinema Roxy and Rex, that's before Al Khayyam, belonged to the Saudai family, owners and importers of films who at one stage also dabbled in film production with the pioneering Ali Awaisam film. Maybe we'll be talking about that in other contexts. Their cinema showed mostly Hollywood. I recall Rita Hayworth in Gilda and the song that was then on every lip at school. Zorro and Flash Gordon serials and the Indian Chabok Valley were the other more plebeian cinemas. Um, with uh, a raucous commentary and encouragement from the audience, <laughs> cautioning the hero, saying, Balak, Balak, Warak, Jai. <laughs> Similarly, with an Egyptian, with the Egyptian Antar wa Abla, seen numerous times by the downtown crowds who memorized and joined in the songs and dialogues, Antar Yaham Yeha, Jai Bahal Yeha, etc. The Egyptian films, with their songs of Abdul Wahab, Um Kalthum, Farid Latrash, were great hits all round, perhaps not as much with the Jewish audience who preferred Hollywood, but with me personally. I can still recall and repeat the songs. During the long summer, there were the open-air cinemas in the evening, venues for family and friends outings. Now I come to schools. For a primary school, I was sent to a local one called Madame Adil. This was quite an institution at the time. The said Madame was a Syrian Christian, a formidable lady with a mild husband. There were two branches. Our, our local one in Sadun had mostly Jewish pupils. The other in Alifi suburbs was more mixed and mostly upper class Muslims. In later life, I met many Iraqis who went to that school. The school had a reputation for academic quality, but dressed by a disciplinary culture with frequent beatings, cane strokes on the hand palm. The two main teachers, I recall, were Jewish women, but they spoke with an assumed Syrian accent as part of the school's identity. The school was mixed, boys and girls, and mostly Jewish in that branch, but with some Muslims and Christians. Secondary transfer for me was to a Jewish school, 
at that time, I think it must have been 1949, when the Jewish community was in crisis and flux with the prospect of migration. The first year was the old Shamash school near the Maidan, in the old center near the markets and old government buildings. It was an old oriental house with a courtyard. The following year, with the imminent departure of the major part of the community, Jewish schools were consolidated in the new Frank Aini uh, building in a suburb of Baghdad. It's already been mentioned and pictures of it shown. We were conveyed there by school bus. The school had a high academic reputation, teaching partly in French from the old Alliance section and all in English in addition to the government Arabic syllabus and the official baccalaureate examination. I shall here concentrate on an interesting aspect of school memory, the Muslim teachers. Starting in first year in Shamash and continuing through my secondary years, we had a succession of Muslim teachers in Arabic and history and other subjects. Most of our teachers in science and math subjects were local Jewish. Uh, some English were British, some teaching English were British or other foreigners. One veteran teacher in Arabic, however, was Jewish, the, re the renowned Sid Simha, who I think maybe is still alive in, in Israel. I see him every Saturday. Do you? Uh, it's kind of Semini Silman, I get it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. She asked, she asked my brother about me. That's right. In addition, we had those Muslim teachers, mostly language and literature, but also history and geography. There were three who had followed particular career pattern for a brief period, for a brief period in Shamash, we had Hussein Mruwa, later to become a leader of the Lebanese Communist Party and eventually assassinated there. Then we had Mohammed Sharara, and for all the years in Frank Aini, Mohammed Hassan al Souri, Sour uh, Tire in Lebanon. All three of Lebanese origin were products of the Shi'i seminary of, in Najaf where the curriculum was strong in Arabic language and literature. And they all abandoned religion for leftist politics. They were communists. I don't know whether their employment in the Jewish school was related to their blockage in other employment. Mohammed Sharara, an impressive teacher, went on to a career which included a spell uh, teaching and broadcasting in Beijing before he settled back in Lebanon. My, my encounter with him was brief, but he impressed the older classes, one of whom was Sesson Sumer, the late Sesson Sumer, who went on to become professor of Arabic literature at Tel Aviv University and wrote on his relation with Sharara and was in correspondence with his daughter in London, who is here. Mariam, my old friend. Um, I was to encounter Muhammad Sharara much later in the 1970s in London in Mariam's house. And it was a wonderful uh, emotional reunion. Um, and Mariam is, uh, was an old friend. She was a fellow graduate student at Leicester University. And then for a, she was at Birkbeck for a, a, a while. Suri was the most and prolonged influence. Suri's teaching of literature and history were truly inspirational. He seemed to live and delight in the episodes of the poet's lives, adventure, and humor. He related the anecdotes, some funny, some tragic, behind the poems and conventions of the, that ruled the expressions. al mutanabbi Abbasid poet, complex verse was brought to life with context, anecdote, and delight in subtlety and symbol. To this day, I recall and recite with pleasure these compositions. Equally Abu Nuwas, the other Abbasid poet of wine and pleasure, Jarir and Farazdaq, the antagonists of the Umayyad era, biting satire and mutual ridicule, 
Al-Ma'arri, mystic and humanist, and into the modern era, Muhammad Mahdi al-Jawahiri, who had already been mentioned, the radical poet of Iraq in the 20th century. All these have remained with me and kept up my interest and erudition in Arabic, history, and the classics. In my work, I have written essays on Jawahari and other themes of modern Iraqi literature. The education and inspiration I got in those years were truly formative. One little anecdote, Muhammad Hassan al-Suri ran the school library in Frankaini, and I was his assistant, but he did not know English very well. At one point, he asked me to help him translate from English an article in the magazine Soviet Literature for his own magazine, then El Magella. I left Baghdad for school in England in 1954 after graduating from high school with the government baccalaureate and a few GCE passes, including classical Arabic. It's interesting, classical Arabic, okay. Interesting, the classical Arabic that we studied for the GCE. Part of it was uh, Quran translations, and uh, but uh, the Muslim teachers, including Sori, could not teach us the Quran translation because they didn't know English. So it was a Jewish teacher who uh, did that for us. Um, my 16 years in Baghdad coincided with many stormy periods, which have been very widely reviewed by my other colleagues. Stormy periods for the country and for the Jews. It all registered in my consciousness and mental formation. My immediate family did not migrate with the great exodus. The later 1950s till 1963, as has already been mentioned, the Qasim regime was relatively favorable to the Jews. I went back for Christmas holidays twice in 1961-62 and 62-63. I left for the last time in January 1963, a few weeks before the first Baptist coup d'etat, which displaced and murdered Qasim. It was a lucky escape for me, as I was associated while I was there with friends from the UK student days who were leftists and suffered intense persecution under the first Baptists. My family and the remaining Jews managed to survive in the early 1960s till what's already been described, the great disasters that followed the 1967 war, then the sec second Baptist coup d'etat of 1968, and the reign of terror of which the Jews were victims, including my family, as we lost my father in those events. The survivors left clandestinely in 1970. I have here recounted mostly the positive experiences which formed my earlier life and made me Iraqi, among other things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful, amazing presentations. Um, we, uh, obviously, coming from such different uh, experiences, different perspectives, uh, but I think together they give us uh, uh, an incredibly complex picture of uh, what it meant to be an Iraqi Jew, uh, displaced Iraqi Jews in the wake of uh, so many different experiences from the partition of Palestine, the creation and the establishment of the State of Israel, to, of course, the various revolutions and coup d'etats within Iraq. Um, we would have a chance to ask our wonderful per uh, presenters, uh, have a Q&A session and a discussion with them, but uh, we will take uh, a break. Uh,